Well, there are two things that Jesus talked about very much in the New Testament. One is money, and uh, he had a lot to say about money, and we don't talk much about money in the church. And the second thing that he talked about was the afterlife, what happens after we die. And we don't really know because there's a curtain, like up on a stage, there's a big curtain and all we see is what's on the spectator side, what we can see. But if you've ever been to a play or a musical or things like that, there's always stuff going on behind the curtain. The curtain closes and they, they do a scene change and they do movement and they do all kinds of things happen that we don't see and then the curtain opens and boom, everything is different. Well, today's passage is one of those passages where we get to see behind the curtain. And the Wizard of Oz is not the man behind the curtain. So let me ask you this, are you preparing for eternity? No. Have you prepared? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Have you prepared yourselves? Because eternity equals forever. Eternity is what is behind the curtain. And so this means that we will live forever in heaven or hell. In Mark's gospel, he writes this. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? It's a valuable question. See, Jesus cares very much about your future, your eternal future. And we find a true story of life after death here in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who, faced, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, he said to him, 
If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Why is this a true story? Well, because it's in the Bible and because it's a story that Jesus himself told. And it's a reminder of how much Jesus cares for each person. So who are the players in this story? Well, we have the rich man, probably rich enough to buy the whole island of Palm Beach or whatever island that he, that he wanted. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett would not even make the top 10 richest people compared to this guy if they had such a list at the time. And the man was dressed in purple and fine linen. Fine linen, fine clothes, the best clothes. I mean, we like to buy bed sheets that are fine linen. We look at the thread count because the thread count says that they are better sheets. So when we're buying sheets, we look for the best thread count. But this guy was living in luxury. He feasted at e he feasted at every meal. He ate sumptuously. And he dressed in purple every day, which means he was flaunting his wealth. He was living in this this fine splendor every day. Now, why is purple so important to this story? Well, in Roman times, it took to obtain one pound of Roman, of, of purple dye in Roman times, it took four million mollusks or sea snails. So if you wanted one pound of purple, you had to get four million sea snails. There wasn't any writ dye here which cost three dollars for an eight ounce bottle. You had to go out and get the, the sea snails and the sea snails only produced one drop of the purple dye. And so if you wanted lots of purple dye, you needed lots of snails. To get lots of snails, you needed lots of people to go out and get the snails and then take the snails apart to get the purple out of them. So that meant it cost a lot of money. And only rich people could afford to wear purple garments. It would have been about ten or or fifteen thousand or twenty thousand dollars cost for just a simple purple garment. So no doubt this guy is rich, and it tells us so in verse nineteen. Rich man who is dressed and clothed in purple which was hard to obtain, fine linen, and he feasted sumptuously every day. He feasted sumptuously or lavishly or ate in luxury. This guy had more food and then some. He was living the good life. Benvito la buena vita. Ricky Martin ran up, sang a song about La Vida Loca, the crazy life, but this guy was living the rich life. He was living the good life. 
La Buena Vida. And so he ate a good meal at every single meal that he ate. And, and Jesus is showing us a picture here, the difference. This guy ate whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. He feasted every day. And the, the opposite of a rich man, which is deeds, they call them deeds because that's the Latin word for rich or money bags. So he's been given the name deeds because he was rich or a play on words, Mr. Moneybag. And so we have the rich guy. Now we have Lazarus, who's the other player. He's the opposite. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. He doesn't have much clothes at all, let alone purple clothes. And Lazarus was a poor man. He had no money, no resources, no protection, and the people that he knew could not help him, so they brought him and laid him at the rich man's gate, hoping that the rich man would help him. And he's there with these sores. And the rich man could have done something. He had the ability, he had the means. Even if he just brought out a plate of leftovers for Lazarus. But he did nothing. He didn't do anything. And so we find him in the op opposite of the rich man. And it tells us that Lazarus in verse 21 desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. So Lazarus is hungry. He, he wanted to be fed. He didn't care if it was just crumbs that fell on the floor. I mean, we don't even eat the crumbs that fall on the floor. Unless you go by the five-second rule. But he would take whatever. He didn't care if it fell on the floor. It didn't matter. He would take anything that he could get. And whoever laid him at the gate was thinking the same thing or hoping that he would receive some help. And so the poor guy's lying there starving and the dogs come and they lick his sores. I mean, this guy couldn't even afford bandages. And I mean, it must have been some sight. You would have noticed him. There was no way you could walk past this guy and not see him. And Jesus is telling us something about these two men. And there are some lessons here for us. The first lesson is found in verse 22. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. The rich man died, the poor man died, and you and I are going to die. That's the first lesson. The poor man was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. He went God's limousine style. And the rich man died, and it simply says he was buried. No angels, nothing fancy. And he ends up in Hades. And in verse 23, it says this. The rich man also died and was buried, and he was in Hades, being in torment, 
he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. It tells us that the rich man was in torment. And he looks up and he sees across the chasm or across the way, there's Lazarus. He finally sees Lazarus, recognizes him, and kind of a, a little bit too late at this point. See, learn this lesson. We are going to die. And in this story, we see the angels for one and the other was just simply buried. Did you know that 6,775 people die each day? That's 2 million pe people a year. That's just in the United States. The flu kills 36,000 people a year. The flu. This is real people. This is right here in the United States. This is not just numbers or statistics. This is you and me. This is people that are dying. So let's jump ahead a minute to verse 27. And he said, the rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. So Lazarus is at Abraham's side. He's receiving all kinds of good things now. No more hunger or suffering. He's probably healed. He's receiving good things and he's comforted. But back at verse 24. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. The rich man is now a beggar. And all he's longing for is just one drop of water. To cool his tongue. He's now in agony and he wants to cool his tongue. But just as he ignored Lazarus while he had the chance to help him in some small way, I mean, all Lazarus wanted was just a crumb. Now the rich man watched just a drop of water. He's begging for help. So is there a teaching, is there a lesson here for us? See, the rich man's not being ignored in the story as Lazarus was. He gets answers. And as he gets answers, we learn something from those answers. And the rich man doesn't like the response in verse 25. But Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things <clears throat> and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. See, this tells us the truth, the facts of the matter. Now Lazarus is feasting. He's leaning against Father Abraham. This is how they ate in biblical times. John's Gospel tells us one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. They reclined and they leaned up against each other. It was a position of fellowship or of sharing a meal or sharing good times. When we enjoy feasting in heaven, we are going to do it with those that we love. 
things will change as we get into eternity. In this case here, it was a complete reversal. That's why Jesus tells us, do not worry. This is why we need to trust the promises of the Bible. Things will be different for some in a good way, others in a way that was not expected and cannot be changed after death once we cross over into eternity. See, Abraham lived in the Old Testament times in Genesis before the law was given in the Old Testament. And if you look at Abraham's life, yeah, he made some mistakes, he did some things wrong, but he lived his life trusting God by faith. He didn't have much knowledge or proof to go on for the things he did or the way he followed God, but he trusted God and the promise of the coming Messiah, Jesus. And so we see the promise of faith happening here with both Abraham and Lazarus. Now here's another lesson for us. Just because you are rich doesn't mean you won't get into heaven. So you don't have to go dig up your gold in the backyard and cash it in and get rid of it. Just because you're rich doesn't mean you won't get into heaven. See, the Pharisees taught that if you were rich, you were good in God's eyes. If you were rich, everything between you and God was good. You had no worries. But Jesus tells them, wake up, because the poor guy is rewarded and the rich guy is sent off for punishment. But the reason the rich guy went to Hades is not because of money. So if you're sitting here today, and you have money, it's not going to keep you out of heaven. The rich man was punished because he was selfish. He had many chances to help and feed Lazarus, but he didn't care for him. He didn't take him in. He didn't get medicine for him. The rich man had all these blessings but he didn't use one of them to help someone less fortunate. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It only matters how you use it. So this passage in the Bible is telling us to examine our attitude toward money and possessions. Jesus was concerned for the poor. So we as a church need to be concerned for the poor. And we are. Our food pantry is part of that ministry. The bread and pastry run. Collecting school supplies, the Salvation Army Christmas tree. It's all part of our mission. And riches and money are not bad things. Remember, it is the love of money. As I taught two weeks ago, the rich man definitely loved money. It's the love of money that causes problems, and we see that with the rich man. I mean, he showed off the fact to everybody with his purple, with his linen, with his meals, that he was wealthy. The third lesson for us is, death is not the end. There is a coming judgment. 
The rich man went to Hades, which is different from hell. One is temporary, the other is permanent. See, Hades is the temporary place of the dead as they await judgment. The permanent place of punishment is known as hell, also known as the lake of fire. And all of us will stand before Christ for judgment. It tells us so in Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 through 15. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and the one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead. All were judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. See, from this passage, there are two sections of Hades. One place is called Abraham's bosom, and the other place is for those awaiting punishment. Well, today, Abraham's bosom is empty because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. He emptied out whoever was waiting in Abraham's bosom and brought them with him to heaven. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took Prisoners into captivity, he gave gifts to the people. But what does he ascended mean except that he descended to the lower parts of the earth? Hades. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heaven that he might fill all things. So when we die, we either go into the presence of Jesus or we go to Hades to await judgment. In this passage, we see the rich man praying. But it won't do any good at that time. See, verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. Once we get to where we're going in eternity, we are there. We're not going from here to there or from there to here. Hades to heaven or heaven to Hades. We have been told the truth, so it is time for us to act or to make a decision now on what we've been told by Jesus. And it comes down to faith. Abraham had faith and he trusted God. And we need to do the same thing. We need to trust in Jesus and his promises. Because now is the time to make a decision. We won't have the chance. 
Even if we have regret, we will not have the chance to do something different after we die. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 222. Would you please stand? There is a fountain, number 222.